So this topic was decided on uh, before the war, and this last war, and it was decided on uh, before there were so many articles uh, in the press that really uh, examined in ways that I don't recall them ever doing before um, these types of dilemmas. Okay, so some of this may repeat some things that you that you've read, but you're hearing it from. It's not a first-hand perspective because I'm just the mother, okay? Um, but uh, a lot, you know, the bulk of these stories are, are via my son, um, who's an officer uh, in Givati. Um, and he's in one of those, uh, you know, everyone says to me, is every Israeli soldier an elite commando? Uh, so this is the story. What does elite mean, I think? Uh, is that you have to qualify to get into the unit, okay? That not just anyone can get in, and you have to go through an arduous, uh, you know, three or four day, uh, I guess you'd call it a hazing, but not really, uh, you know, very, very difficult uh, qualifying thing. And then you have an extra long training period <coughs> ranging from 16 months to two years whereas a soldier in a normal unit will have a three to six month training period. So there's a lot more additional training. It's a lot more specialized. Um, and those units are generally small. You know, they, they range from 15 to 25 guys, okay, in each unit. And the Americans translate that as like special ops or uh, I think that's how they usually, uh, a recon is the right word. In this case. Uh, it's a reconnaissance unit because they go first and they go forward uh, before the rest of the troops go in, okay? So the guys in these uh, units, they're called the Palsar, the, the Plugat Siur, the, the team that, that goes in to do a Siur. Uh, one guy in the team uh, is trained uh, in video work, okay? You know, they have, it's called the pakal, each soldier has a special task in addition to what all the soldiering things that they've learned, okay? And so one guy in each unit is, is trained in a video camera and he wears uh, a video camera on his helmet. They don't bring in photographers with them or, you know, and they don't endanger someone who's not a soldier to go in with them, but there is a soldier wearing uh, a video, and these videos are not used for publicity uh, purposes. I tried to get copies of things that I was able to see years ago in about 2006. I was not able, um, you know, to get copies of them, so you'll just have to listen to my description of what I saw. But the main use for these videos um, is for analysis and learning. Um, they have this arduous debriefing process after every mission, after every thing that they do, okay? And part of the debriefing is watching these videos um, and watching videos from the uh, Maslatim, uh, which I think in English is a drone, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like a, a, it's not a satellite, but it's a, okay, so it's a we'll drone. Probably. Yeah, so uh, when they're going over, um, what just happened, which they do after everything that they do, and it's really, when I say arduous, I mean over and over again with different officers and from different <coughs> points of view. Um, so they're going over it with their soldiers to teach them. You know, sometimes they're going over it to figure out what happened, okay, because in, in under fire, things get very confusing, overwhelming, you know, we, 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 most of us experience this through the movies where, where it's bedlam and it's chaotic and it's noisy and it's smoky and everything. And, and this is their work, you know, for a few years of their lives. So they, they debrief by looking at this and that's why the, the drone video the information is so important because when you're on the ground, my son was explaining this to me, you're under fire, you can't figure out all the time where the firing is coming from. And when you have the information, uh, you know, the guy <coughs> with the video is on the same level as them. But when you, when you have the, the information uh, from the air, then you can make a map uh, that makes more <coughs> sense, okay? 
Um, so uh, one, you know, there are a few of these videos that I was able to see um, which stick in my mind, okay? Uh, the first one was um, you, you see down the scope of a gun with the sights, I believe it's called, you know, it's the, it's the X where you have someone in your sights. So the video is shown through the scope of the, of the gun. And uh, one thing I have to say um, is that uh, the, the equipment is amazing uh, and really cutting edge for these smaller units. And, you know, I don't have the technical knowledge to explain <coughs> most of it, uh, but these scopes uh, that these commando units get are like something, you know, amazing in terms of the things that they can do, and the way they can see in in the night and through the smoke and all of this, and the sensors that they have. So uh, you see, you see a terrorist uh, in an alley, uh, and uh, he's in the line of fire okay, in the bead of the gun, uh, and th there's this moment where he realizes that he's in the sights, okay, that, that he has a bead on him, and he looks to the right, he looks, you know, he looks around, and he grabs something, and you don't, like, see what he's grabbing until he lifts it, and he's grabbing a kid's backpack, like a school bag, but it's attached to the kid. And he lifts up this like first grader, you know how they're so distinctive because they, their backpack is larger than they are and they try to walk with them. So he lifts the backpack and he goes like this, okay? And uh, then you, and you hear the, the, the soldier who's holding the gun has to ask for instructions, okay? Because this is against, uh, <coughs> The rules, okay, you do not, you, you don't, uh, you don't shoot. And he calls, you know, for instructions, and, and the higher officer than him uh, confirms, you know, yes, uh, you can't take him out now, you can't shoot now, and you see the, the gun being lowered, okay? That's one uh, video that I saw myself. Another video that I saw uh, is of, um, you see a, a, a mobile rocket launcher, Okay, um, and it's firing, and uh, it fires a few missiles, and then they like <coughs> pack it up, and then you see that they're packing it up in an ambulance, <laughs> and it's a you know it's a red crescent ambulance, La Coldavar, you know it, mm -hmm. it doesn't it, it look it doesn't <coughs> look like an ambulance, it is an ambulance, um, and they pack in the the missile launcher and they pack the, the missiles that they haven't yet fired, and you see them, it's, it's unmistakable, you know, they're <coughs> missiles, and they're loading them back. Uh, and the same, and it drives away. And, and the, same, the same procedure happens, where, where the soldier who, who is screening this calls for, you know, for uh, in further instruction, and they say no, you know, because we don't hit ambulances, okay? Now, this was in 2006, and, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing, it's very well known, and, and for me it's very gratifying to see these things finally making it into the, into the news media, because for years it's been, Isra Israel alleges, comma, <coughs> you know, uh, Israel claims, comma, um, and, uh, you know, there, there's something at least validating in terms of your reality testing that what you're reading uh, in the press report confirms to what you're hearing, you know, from your from your kid. A last example of something that I saw um, is that um, actually this one I didn't see with my own eyes, but my son described to me, um, where he was uh, walking with several of his of his chayalim, uh, several of his soldiers, and they pass. This is in Gaza, and they pass. Uh, a home where some someone is is uh, you know has a, a, a gun okay pointed at them and he's uh, he's resting the gun. he's in a kitchen okay not an abandoned home he's in a kitchen okay and in back of him is a woman and 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 her two kids because it's her kitchen uh, that this terrorist has just you know 
come in to shoot from. And it's the same, you know, it's the same dilemma, okay? Um, you have to ask the same question, you know. Uh, so when, you know, I'm like very naive about this, like, so I'm like, when is it okay, you know, to shoot back? Like, is it okay if they're shooting at you first? You know, is it okay? You know, these, like, uh, questions of the mother, um, you know, like, uh, to, to try to get, to try to get some, I guess, consolation, you know, because otherwise you just imagine um, them with their hands tied um, in some of these situations. And, um, I, yeah. In that third scenario, also, there were not fire? Yeah. Um, now, you know, I, I tried to ask, uh, 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 you know, have things changed? I'm not aware of any official changes, okay? And obviously things are different when you're firing from the air, okay? But, but even from the air, you, you know, the same tactic, um, when, when, they, when they know they're being targeted, you know, either because they hear a helicopter <coughs> plane or whatever, they send the civilians in the building up to the roof. Okay, and they stand on the roof and they look up. Um, so, anyway, um, now, uh, there's a lot of um, talk among the soldiers themselves about this whole, this whole experience, this whole dilemma, and. Um, my son once used this expression, which is not his, which they use, okay? Um, he said, yeah, we show up like the pizza delivery. And I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, you call in advance, you tell them you're coming, you estimate how much what's going to be there, it'll be about 20 minutes, and you show up and you knock. You know, you knock and you say, pizza. Um, and it, it, like so many of these things, which I may show you, uh, they're funny, you know, in a, in a very caustic, in a very bitter way. Um, and, you know, there's this whole discussion, I think, now about whether the, whether, whether the army is soft, you know, because of all of this advance warning and, and so on. And, and you do know, I mean, that leaflets are distributed uh, phone calls are made and SMSs are sent. And I'm reminded of a, an article I read recently. You know, I'm a, a trauma therapist. That's what I do in my life now. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a heartbreaking article about a Gazan trauma psychologist who does the same thing that I do, no, but in Gaza. Saw okay, you saw it? So Anybody? <laughs> so he. You know, it was a heartbreaking article. First, he's talking in general about what it's like uh, to to work with kids who have PTSD, who have post-traumatic stress disorder, um, when you know that you're going to fix them in the best case scenario. You're going to heal them. You're going to make them feel better. But uh, in, in another year or year and a half, there's going to be another war, and they're going to be traumatized again. You have to start all over again, okay? Which is a dilemma I very much relate to because one of the kind of rules of thumb of working with trauma when you try to heal someone from their post-trauma is you have to be sure that the trauma's over. Okay, you can't fix something that's ongoing in the same way. So, so I'm reading this and I'm like, you know, very much relating and empathizing to what he's going through. And he had a terrible, you know, thing happen where a building he was in was bombed and he lost six or maybe even nine members of his family, his two brothers and, his sis and a sister-in-law. And he's now responsible for the 11 of his older brother's children that he now has to provide for, right? And I'm telling the story, uh, because of this one line, which really blew me away. Um, he was talking, and uh, the thing he was stuck on, the thing that he, that, he, that he couldn't get over, he really couldn't believe, was he kept saying, he said, 
I had complete trust that the Israelis would warn us. They've always warned us in the past. And apparently in this particular hit, they were not warned. Which happens? It's war. You know, it's war, right. But I'm just saying, what blew me away is his complete, he used, he used the word trust, his complete trust that this is the way things operate. There will be a warning, and you can run out of the house. Okay, and so that was something that totally disoriented him about how this happened to him. Okay, it's not the first time that he had to run out of the house and escape a bombing, but, but what he couldn't really get, get clear about was that it didn't happen that morning, and that to me, uh, you know, showed me what an assumption it is, you know, that the warning will come. Okay, um, I have my list in here, which is why I keep uh, checking. Um, so, I want to talk about um, a couple things. Um, so, uh, when my son, this whole issue of the tunnels has only really made the news during this war. They've been mentioned in the past, but not in great detail. And the Army has known about them for a very, very long time. Um, and my son was in Lebanon during the, the last Lebanon, the second time. And uh, he said that Hezbollah, the tunnels are even better uh, than in Gaza. He said that they have showers in a tunnel. Okay. In other words, like we're talking about a place, it's like a, it's a place to live underground. If you imagine an intricate subway system that runs, you know, all underground. And the, all, the entrances, at least in Lebanon, the entrances go through these very nice villas that are near the border. Okay? And I, I, from what I understand, the way it works is Hezbollah builds those homes you know, for the people who live in them. They get the home with the understanding that everything below ground belongs to Hezbollah, okay? And, and we've learned similar things about Gaza now, that there, there's actually like a, I don't know if I should call it legal, but there's like an agreement, an official agreement that's made, okay? When someone's home is used uh, for a tunnel entrance or exit, that What's above ground is theirs. What's below ground, they have no right to. Okay, that this is just stated very, very explicitly. So my son described. Um, he was trying to really explain how impossible the situation was, and he said they threw a smoke bomb, colored smoke, like you know, you, you throw it and it emits uh, green smoke. It doesn't destroy anything. So they, they, they found a, a tunnel, and they were in a city, like with a large square or courtyard. They threw one of these green smoke bombs down into the tunnel, and they looked at the courtyard, okay, and about a dozen homes turned green. Uh, and so he said to me, do, do you understand? <coughs> like they're, they're all, it's not a question like we have to find where it starts and where it ends. It's all networked, it's all connected. And when we saw that, you know, we realized we weren't, you know, you don't, you don't, we don't send soldiers down in, into situations like that. Yeah. What does it mean that it turned green? It means, it means if, you, if it's smoke. And if you throw it down the entrance to the tunnel, which is why they did this, and then you look, Green smoke came out the other ends of all these, all you know, connected. dozen or so That's places, amazing. meaning they were all connected to this tunnel. They can come and go through the Yes, and, and that's why, in, in the, I'm talking about the, the, the time, the last time that my son was there, he's in, he's in reserves now and he's in the army, but he's not inside, he's relieving uh, the younger soldiers who needed to be spelled, okay? Um, so, um, I forgot. Yes. 
We don't want to sound this down. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, how hard it is for the soldiers. How hard? Yeah. So, um, I think, you know, the, the whole, um, the thing that they're most afraid of, really, uh, is kidnapping. Okay, and and this is the this is the thing they're drilled in the most, um, and that's why going down the tunnels is so dangerous. Okay, it's not that they're afraid of being killed. Like it's not just about that, um, but that's like a because apparently the tunnels have these built-in little cubby holes. You know, a st they call them in the newspapers this this month storage storage facilities. Um, yeah, right. You know, where you can get down in the tunnel and hide, hide someone in these storage facilities. Anyway, um, so I want to, you know, I am, um, oh, I know what, where I was. There's a unit called OKETS. Has anyone ever heard of it? <laughs> okay. Should I or shouldn't I? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's the it's a you know once I've said this about the net the way the tunnels actually work and and I've talked about the the high tech you know things that you know they they send them to these units uh, as pilots to see how they work and then they send feedback to the tech companies about how they're working. So my son is describing this uh, this camera, you know, that walks. You know, it's a little tiny camera, and you, you send it ahead by itself. Yes. You know, it's a little robot, and it takes pictures. You know, mm. things like that, or guns that shoot at right angles. Science fiction. Wow. Science fiction? Did I hear? So uh, I, I listened to a um, to a uh, engineer from Rafael company that, that produced the Iron Dome, and he spoke about how when they came to the Americans to, to propose uh, the Iron Dome, uh, they said to him, they said to them, to the team, you know, this is science fiction. You know, you can't, you can't make a bubble, you know, in the air, like a virtual bubble. Uh, and they were denied funding, okay, at the first time. Uh, and they went back after the first trial where at that point their success rate was like in the low 80s, you know, the low 80 percent. They went back, uh, and then they got the funding, and now this, the the success rate is 90 percent. Um, 90 what? 90 percent success. 90 success of interception, of blocking missiles. Um, so what I was going to say about OKETS, OKETS is a, a very small unit. Um, that works with dogs, and each chayal, feel free to correct me, yeah? Each soldier um, is paired with a dog um, that they, that is their dog, it's their partner. And they <coughs> train this dog 15 months, yeah? 15 months of training with the dog, okay? It's actually nine months. Hmm? Nine. Nine months, okay. Nine months of training, thank you, with the dog. And um, the, the, the dogs are used in a number of ways. Um, you know, if you would, do you want to sure. explain? Can you go to the front? This is the boat here. Okay. Go to the front. Go to Bring them off. I saw Tammy. Um, so I'm Yuval, I'm the Netzer Shaliyah in Sydney. Um, I was born in Peru, that's why I have this accent. Um, <laughs> so I met Aliyah and I, I go to Bokeh's unit. Um, it's a very <coughs> interesting unit, it's a very small unit. We also have the trials uh, Kibush to enter the unit. Um, once you finish the training, a normal infantry training, then you do a uh, elite training, like most of the common, uh, com commandos. And then you train with dogs for eight, nine months. Um, so each soldier gets a, a dog, and you train with him. Um, and you are with him for 
almost 24 hours a day. And during the time you train, you know that only you can feed your dog, walk your dog. Um, you have all the equipment that it's also useful for yourself and for your dog. You have food in your um, vest. You have uh, medical equipment for the dog. You have more water that you use for yourself and for the dog. And it gets to a connection that it's something that I never could imagine uh, with an animal. At the same time, you know you're risking your best friend um, to save lives of other soldiers. Um, so it's really hard, um, but it's an impressive unit. Thank you so much. What happened to the dogs when you left? The German shepherds, no? Yes, most of them are Belgian shepherds, uh, Melinois, yes. Um, Do you take them home with you when you go? Depends on, on the age of the dog. I took my dog home after the army, yes. What? No, what not after the army. When you go No, 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 they stay in base. They stay in base. Mm -hmm. What happened if you, when you finish your Seville and you finish the yeah, army? Yeah. You, you take your dog, yeah. nobody else gets a dog after you. Well, depends on, on the age of the dog. And if, if it's an old dog, then you take it home. And after, like in, during Middle East, you don't have dogs. You are just infantry. <coughs> what was your dog's name? Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Ironic, you never know what's going to get to you, especially when you work in trauma and you're exposed. I'm exposed to the worst things on a regular basis. And I found myself weeping over this article uh, that said, um, it was actually just a headline, it said five, it was in the list of casualties, you know, and it said five OPEX dogs were killed. And I have to confess that I'm not a, a dog lover um, to my other son's great sorrow. Um, and um, I, this, this so got to me, uh, this little one-liner, because you know that each of those dogs died and saved, we cannot say how many soldiers with their death, okay? And the other reason that I was so upset is that I know, as a, as a trauma therapist, and I don't know if you know this, you well, but um, the OKETS guys who have lost their partner, meaning their dog, uh, are at the highest risk of, of PTSD. <coughs> for two reasons, uh, uh, for many reasons, okay? But you can figure it out, yeah? Guilt. Number one, number one, um, is what you just said, I think, which is guilt, where you have this bond and, and this dog trusts you and you've trained it and it, it responds only to your command, okay? And you, it died in the end because it listened to you, okay? So I think that's one reason for the high PTSD. And the other very important reason is that um, the OKITS guys work alone, you know, they, in the end, once they're trained, you know, they're trained all together, but they are then dispatched to these individual command <coughs> units. And so each unit gets an OKITS guy with a dog, right? And so they're not with the Tsevet, they're not with the group uh, in, their, in their work. And, and that's, a, that's for any type of soldier a very high risk of trauma because you don't have the support of the group and the group experience afterwards. Yeah? How are we doing? Heavy, yeah? Yeah. <coughs> Speak a bit louder. Clarify, maybe you can clarify. Uh, I know that Israel have some robots that they're going to check if it's a bomb in the street or for the, ch for the chayal not to be in danger of explosion. Now, my question is, maybe it would be a very naive question. Um, is any way that Israel can use maybe those robots or different type of device to get into the tunnels rather than the chayal going first and to check what's going on inside? 
I don't know. Maybe Serena, you okay. have a question. So this, is, this, is the, the, this is the question, okay? Uh, is when are, when are they, meaning Rafael, you know, the Israel aircraft, and uh, IAI, the industries that, that work in, you know, what the physicists are very busy. <laughs> They're very busy. And, um, you know, what, it's not ready yet, whatever it is. There's something they're working on that senses the density of the ground. That, uh, you know, and, and I understand that it can do it from the air. If that pans out, you know, if that works, uh, you know. Uh, listen, I, I draw tremendous strength from this whole story of the Iron Dome. You know, uh, and, and, and it may, I don't know how many years it will take, but, you know, it, it, it's going to involve some high-tech solution to this very low-tech, you know, form of combat where you have people digging the tunnel with their hands, right? So, but it isn't ready yet. Yeah. I believe that there's a unit in the IDF that deals solely with the morality uh, of warfare, mm -hmm. where uh, recruits um, are sent as part of their training mm -hmm. to, to to learn how to deal with mm -hmm. with all of these issues. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Or? Yes, but it, I, I, I wouldn't call it a unit. It's a it's a course that everyone has to take. Mm, sorry, yeah. uh, called Toar Haneshe, yeah. uh, the the purity, the purity of weapons, and every soldier uh, has to learn about Torah and Eshek. And the person who writes about this the most, his name is Asha <coughs> Kasher. 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 Kasher, thank you. Okay, and he's a philosopher, and I think he devised it. And, um, uh, yes. Um, I think when we speak about trauma, we also need to mention the civilians who live around Gaza, you know, Tef Aza, uh, that, that this time actually realized that there are tunnels under their homes. And my question is, I guess, is the government in Israel, do you know if the government in Israel are dealing with the trauma of those people who actually flee, flee, fled from their homes? Um, I can't speak for the, for the government. I do know that those people, meaning there are several communities, uh, it's called Otep Aza, you know, the, yeah. the envelope around the border, and they're mostly kibbutzim, they're, you know, they're mostly uh, isolated kibbutzim, and they have been saying that they hear drilling at yeah. night for years, yes. for years, okay, it's not new to them. What's new is that the whole world is talking about it now. And, and another thing that I read uh, uh, is that the tunnels, uh, actually they dig them um, until they get to the last two meters, and the last two meters are not being digged, only when they plan on going on a mission. That's right. when they do <coughs> It's amazing how much information we have and how at the moment stymied we are, you know, to solve it. Yeah. I understand in, in all war there are casualties that uh, were not meant to be, but I don't understand why don't they, if they know where these tunnels are, the entrance to the tunnels, being used by terrorists, why don't they gas the tunnels? Yeah, exactly. Because you don't gas the tunnel. But you gas, but if there's no one in there, what's the answer? You have to blow it. I mean, they can use it after, it's because we gas in there. If no one in there, what's the point of gas? Please. If not on the gas question, but I'd like to emphasize. My name's Egal, and I served for 25 years as an officer in the artillery. And I'd like to relate to something that Ricky said in passing, but I think it's, it's probably a very important point to emphasize. Um, as, as the IDF, and I know it from our unit, how much we've developed new weaponry and just been talking about, and this is not science fiction, it sounds credible, guns fine at 90 degrees and robots doing work for soldiers and the world is becoming more modern, <coughs> but you still need the human, you still need yeah. the soldier to fight. <coughs> and the reason why the work which uh, Ricky and her people are doing is becoming even more important is 
despite the, the, the war field becoming much more modern and the 2000 technological, the trauma because of the individual decisions made by the individual soldiers getting so great, that's why the cases of the PS, uh, PTSD yeah, have become greater and even more numerous because each individual soldier, each individual officer is standing for an incredible <coughs> deliberations and because of the things that Ricky was talking about, they've become a very, very high risk and very, very serious <coughs> problem in the IDF and I just wanted to emphasize that. Thank you. Listen, I, I, I really um, am happy for these questions, but I'm going to um, uh, try to get to a couple things, okay, at the, at the expense of your questions. Um, um, a point about, you, you asked this question about the communities around and what's been done, you know, the whole issue of reporting what's being done, you know, uh, there was a, <coughs> Fox News is a very pro-Israel um, channel in the States. It's so pro-Israel that it, it, it endangers its credibility. Yeah. It has like no objectivity. Mm -hmm. Okay, but anyway, we'd like to see it, you know. <laughs> so they, they published a, uh, a video of an interview in Sterot, uh of a bomb shelter Okay, that has been built with American donations. Um, and I, I'm describing this as a vignette and as a counter to the tunnel images, which are so disturbing. You have, uh, it's all bright primary colors. It has all this plastic furniture and toys. Uh, it's enormous. It's large enough to house, I forget if it was 600 or 800 children, okay, to all the children of Stero, you know, pretty much. Um, and, um, and, and he's being interviewed, the director, and he's saying, so how long have the kids been here? He said, oh, the, the, whole, the whole war. You know, they've been sleeping here. They've been, you know, this is a, and so the interviewer asks him something about how many kids would you estimate suffer from PTSD? Uh, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And he says, uh, 75, 80 percent. Um, and these are statistics that don't uh, make it to the newspaper. Uh, why? Because, um, you know, what the primary symptom is, is in regression is bedwetting, okay? Is this a news item? And, and when you think of, you know, what happens when three quarters of the kids Okay, are having symptoms like that, or uh, you know, are afraid to take their shoes off, you know, because they have to be ready to run, uh, you know, and, and that's also it's a it's a, a kind of echo of, of the the chayalim who come home and are so excited, um, uh, yeah, to take their shoes off because they can't they can't take the because because it's a, a hikon, you know, it's a, a you have to be ready at every at every minute. Um, now, I have, uh, ha has, have you heard about this, uh, this video of the song that Hamas put out? And has that yes. made it over here? Which so, one? so what I'd like to do, <laughs> you know, there are a lot more disturbing and heavy things uh, to bring up, and I'm choosing not to, okay? Just because of uh, the way the way I feel looking around the room. Okay, I think it's enough. Okay, uh, and uh, I have uh, two pictures uh, that I was sent um, during the war uh, that made me feel, that either made me laugh uh, or, or made me smile, and uh, it pointed out to me how uh, how our Chayalim cope and how important the use of humor, particularly black humor, is mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> sharpened to a point that you would not believe, okay, really cutting uh, humor. Um, and the other thing is this, this video uh, that was released by Hamas, which is designed to inspire their fighters to rise up and and do piguim and and commit you know uh, terrorist attacks, okay, and it's a t it has terrible lyrics, you know, uh, 
uh, it has in red, you know, death to Israel, death to, it talks about, you know, killing all the Zionists, you know, it's all, it's a propaganda film. They're all dressed up in their, in their military vest and they're doing all these things. And it was released and it was designed to not only inspire uh, their fighters and people on the street, okay, but it was designed to, to terrorize uh, Israel. I mean, yeah, it was, put on, it was put up on YouTube, okay? And the, the most crazy thing happened, okay? There was this instant response um, in Israel of one parody after another. Okay. There are 470 uh, parodies. 470 <laughs> parodies. Different, the parodies are themed. Okay. Lion King. What? Lion King. Yeah, there's a Lion King Aladdin. parody. There's a, the, the, and, the, the, and there are Israelis singing the lyrics to the song. They didn't change the lyrics. Singing the lyrics in a very bad, you know, incorrect uh, Hebrew, uh, mimicking, uh, you know, the Hamas Hebrew because they have trouble pronouncing certain things. Um, and th there are more, many, many more hits, okay, on these parodies than there are on the original. So I write to my son, uh, can you send me, you know, it's all over some YouTube. of the parodies, right? And he writes me back. You can't show the parodies. The original is so much funnier. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I have here links to these two original things. You know, one is five minutes, one is two minutes. Do you think you're up for this? Yes. yes. I just want to say that, that, to that it's called Tkof Ta'asepi and they change it to Kof. Monkey. Kof Ta'asepi Gwim. Right. It's right. crazy. Right. <coughs> Um, can somebody work this for me? Did you want? They're, they're, they've all been, they're all down here somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Helen? Okay. Just press on there. No, no, no. no. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Which one do you want? Uh, and Helen, is there a light switch behind you? Yes. Yeah. The left one, the left. The left one, the left. The left one is the original. This is the original. That's what I stopped. Okay. What is it? What is important is about this. Press start in there. What is important about this is that for the first time recently, we've seen that they also have a naval commando unit, which is you know military development for them, and you'll see it. Go ahead. Say you 
ציונים, זזה שכונה של ישראל. לפחות הציונים, כל אחד פונה לכיוון אחר, והם מזדנק למוות נבלים, והם מתחבים מאחור לחומות וממורגנים. לפחות הציונים, כל אחד פונה לכיוון אחר, והם מזדנק למוות נבלים, והם מתחבים מאחור לחומות וממורגנים. תדליק בליבה כמו קוראים, מוטט אותה עד בלי יסודות, תדביר יורד כעינת תיקנים, גרם שקוף לציונים, קוף תעשה ריבועים, תלתן קוף לזעזועים, חסר לכל הציונים, זזה את ביטחונה של ישראל, זו של אשליה ולא יוצלח, אבל על הבקח ונעלם where when our guys go into, into Gaza, the fighters melt away. And you know, only now is there this understanding that they're all going underground, underground okay? And their tactic is to uh, draw our boys in uh, so that they can be easily killed or kidnapped rather than to have direct fighting. And I'm not saying that direct fighting doesn't occur, it does, 
but it's not the norm. <coughs> you don't see fighters like this, you know, meeting our <coughs> fighters. It's <coughs> guerrilla war. Okay. Um, now, the this is really a statement about resilience. These parodies. Okay, resilience is about bouncing back. Okay, that's what resilience means, to have the elasticity to bounce back, okay? And in our situations, after a pigua, you know, after a terrorist attack, uh, our cleanup is like some sort of amazing phenomenon, okay? I don't know how to explain it, but that same day, it's all cleaned up. Somehow they get the glazier to come and replace <coughs> the glass the same day. You know, every, everything is all gone, as opposed to the use of pictures to show damage, yeah? Like, it's, it's the opposite <coughs> tactic. Uh, instead of preserving the damage, it's, it, it, it's not erasing it, but yes, it's erased so that life can return immediately. And there will be a memorial. You know, there will be, it's, it'll be marked, but life will be returned. Now, I have two photographs here that I want to show you that I received during the war at a very low point, okay? Very low point. Almost every family had boys who weren't home, okay? Um, can somebody get me those two photographs that, I'm sorry, this one, please, okay? So somebody sent yeah. me this. Okay, you know, in the Israeli papers, uh, they publish candle lighting time for Shabbos in all the major, major cities. Okay. okay, and so they publish candle lighting time in Khan Yunis, Rafia, Beit Lahia, Sajawiya. At candle lighting in the in the tunnels. <laughs> no, I no, it's like no. exploding, no. it's a play on words, exploding the tunnels. It's a play on words. It's a play on words. And so it was, you had to laugh. You had to just smile about this, okay? Because it was witty. Uh, because it made you, you know, wow. feel this whole idea of candle lighting happening in Gaza too, and when they are fighting, Shabbos isn't Shabbos, and you know nothing is the way it's supposed to be. But that that they can, uh, you know, do this was, you know, you know, warmed my heart. Now the next one, I hope you won't think it's in poor taste. I'm very sensitive to things that are in poor taste. This yeah, made me laugh so hard. Okay. Can you translate? Yes. Now, just one second. One second. One of the most uh, publicized thing. Okay, it's not fair because the Israelis are getting it first. <laughs> um, one of the most publicized ideas is that a shahid, a martyr, uh, is met in the next world by 70 virgins. 72, 72 please. Sorry, 72. Don't take them away. 72. <laughs> Don't miss two. Exactly. Exactly. That's how it works. Met with 72 virgins, okay? And one second. And so this says, Hamas has announced a ceasefire. Please, please, moment. He's announced a ceasefire. Um, but this was before there was a ceasefire, and we were all dying for a ceasefire. The parents, not the boys. They wanted to finish, but the parents were all like, oh, please. And Hamas has announced a ceasefire after one of the virgins sent a selfie. Okay. I laughed until I cried. Okay. This is not my sense of humor. Yeah. Okay, I just, I, I, 